Hi, I'm Jonathan Jay, and welcome to dealmakers.co.uk, the number one place to find out all about buying a business. Now, on this video, I want to introduce you to Dee Ludlow, who has bought half a dozen very different businesses over the years and is going to share with you his incredible experiences. Okay, so you are moving from doing smaller deals mm. and I think you started off by making it up as you went along trial and error just 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 doing it which yeah. is admirable yeah. because a lot of people talk about it but don't actually do it yeah. to to bigger deals so let's start at the beginning um, what was the interest in buying a business to start off with so initially when I was younger whether it was property or whether it was just in general entrepreneurship if I found an opportunity where there was some arbitrage there, I would take it. So that's where I started, probably early 20s. Um, very smaller smaller stuff, but um, I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't understand there was a world of sort of M&A back then and buying businesses. Um, so I would have done things a lot differently. And then I started to read about it. And I was like, this this is pretty cool. It's, I think it was in regards to scaling I think scaling to acquisition is mm -hmm. is powerful, and you know, look at the wealthiest people in the world; they're all in business, and most of them are in acquisition, right? So that's when I started to dive in and learn a lot more about it, read some books, watch some YouTube videos, some of yours, and I think from there, I understood there's a process yes. that needs to be yes. done to do it the correct way. And, and the way. process actually is the, is the shortcut. Everyone wants yeah. a shortcut. The shortcut is actually have a process, yeah, because otherwise, it's a it's a very sort of bendy road where you're yeah. you're trying to get to where you want to go but you're 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 going off track all the time yeah where if you've got a process it keeps you keeps you focused doesn't oh, it? oh definitely it's 100 percent needed I, you know without that i would have continued to make mistakes and i still did you know you're always going to make you, you sure. learn as you go and um i think you learn a lot more post acquisition as well because that's the hardest part in my opinion well yeah that's, <laughs> that's absolutely absolutely right i think yes i mean doing doing the deal is is the easier part the mm. integration of two businesses or multiple businesses into one is really difficult yeah. um and just taking over a business and and being the new owner and all the cultural issues the people issues that go with that yeah i think as well um when i was initially looking for opportunities it was more of a case of like you know i wanted to see the potential in the business i wanted stuff that was quite stagnant so i like to say like hundreds and farmers i like to find people that are farming their business so just maintaining it there's not a lot of growth there but they're not in decline either or if they're in decline is mainly because they start to get fed up so that's where the motivation from to sell comes mm -hmm. because every business does need hunters and farmers you need people that are farming because they're they're fulfilling on the hunters promise so the hunters out getting the client and i think just adding that into the business in good time helps scaling i think you can add a lot of value to the business by you know having hunters who go out and get the clients but then uh, a lot of people forget that you do need the farmers to fulfill on the hunters promise otherwise over promise and under delivering it terrible business trade so that's what I was initially looking for I was initially looking in was in construction and um, I didn't understand the retention side of construction with the with the debtors to start with so there's a lot of stuff that was costing us money to go back and do okay and I couldn't understand at the start so I learned very quickly on that side so were you you were new to the sector with construction, yeah, I've been in property and done the whole okay refurb. Um, All right, so you start off as a <laughs> as a property investor. Yeah, start off as a. I've been in business. I've had tons of different things. So loads of startups that have failed as well. Some have done pretty good that I sold. Um, so, I, my business acumen came from making loads of mistakes sure. in my early twenties. <laughs> yeah. um, just trying to do different things in business and. I think experience is the best way to learn, but you know you can fast track it by having help, and yeah. that help stops you from making as many mistakes. And then um, a few opportunities came up where a friend of mine was in the plumbing and gas sector. Um, he had a fairly large contract, did not understand how to run a business or how to scale, how to um, employ staff with regards on managing them as well. Um, so that was my first. Where I seen the opportunity, I was like, look, this is the sector I'm going to target. So I went quite aggressive with it. Um, we was 
we, we bought quite a few, but more to the point, I was looking for engineers that are willing to travel, which is hard to find people that are willing to go away from their family five days a week. Um, but I was looking for businesses that already had these people that had national contracts and we were just taking the contract, consolidating into one company and then using them. It's a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, and you end up losing contracts. Mm, mm. This, you know, as you know, post acquisition, regardless of the transition, some of those relationships have been built in for years and years yeah, with the previous yeah. ownership. So that was hard. Um, you know, I flew back from Dubai twice to, to negotiate, um, renegotiate contracts. Our payment terms were all over the place. I was actually told that this is just how it is in this industry. And I was like, it doesn't make sense that we're doing work we got to pay our Why staff. Why can't we get paid for it on time? Yeah, yeah but we, well, we don't get paid for, for a while. So yeah. um, we did renegotiate that. Bring it. We brought it down massively, which helped. Um, and then recently gone through a management buy on on that company there, which it was more than one, but we consolidated it. Some of them didn't work too well. Um, so I'm actually um, getting paid myself in deferred payments now. But I've done this before with businesses pre previously, before I understood it. Um, and yeah, we've just moved on to other things now. I've sort of built out our um, the sort of senior management team for us as a yeah, as an acquisition company. Brought some people involved. Yeah, that, yeah, let's let's talk about that then because yeah, we because we had a conversation the other week, didn't we? Mm, yeah. and, and I explained to you how uh, a weakness that we had in our senior management team meant I was dragged into things because there wasn't anyone else to do them or, or no one else to make the decisions or to, to solve the problems. And that's when it starts to get you, doesn't it? Yeah. Because before you know it, you're working in the business rather than on the business. So what's your experience of this? Yeah. Um, initially, when I started to understand how to buy a business and being an investor instead of an owner operator. Um, I've been an owner operator so many times in startups where you wear all the hats, so I didn't want to do that. <laughs> um, but I think that I went into it initially too naive to think that I'm not going to spend any time on it mm -hmm. apart from looking at KPIs, looking at, you know, what's coming in, the inflows and outflows. Then you do have to get a little bit more involved um, if you want to continue to build. So the integration was quite hard, um, but I started to realize that I needed... I needed support around me. Um, like our conversation we had is so important and you can't do everything. And I started to, someone that I was helping with his, with his acquisitions and I seen a skill set in him was very different to me. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in many jo joint ventures where we've got the same skill set. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So this guy had a different skill set um, and I felt some synergy. So. I started. To, I brought him on board for further acquisitions, and um, a family member of mine has just gone through an exit himself out in the states, and he wanted to get involved because he's seen the stuff I was doing as well. So it's helped a lot because we all got different skill sets, and um, the my cousin that went through the private equity exit has still got a very good relationship with them. Um, he stayed in, as you know, you can take you know some off the table, and so he rolled I think three times. So. He's oh really? Quite, yeah. Oh right. So, so 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 clearly he was considered to be very important yeah. to the business. Yeah. So he, he they've recently now sold to one of the biggest P firms in the world. So um, it wasn't just his business. That obviously there's there's quite a few, but um, he re, he's seen the company, the group that bought him. They started with like sixty million dollars, and in three or four years they scaled that to a billion. So he's when he's seen that I was sort of doing it, not at that level, but when he's seen that I was doing it, he's like, I want to get involved in this because I've seen what they've done with yes. my business. Well, he knows it's possible. Exactly. Don't you think there's so much of, of having a, a successful mindset in, in business and in life is just knowing that something is possible? Oh, yeah. And when you know it's possible, uh, you it clears out all that doubt. Am I doing the right thing? Yeah, am I wasting my time? All that's gone. And now it's like, I know it's possible. Now I just need to get on and do it. Oh, yeah, I think, yeah, that's self-belief. It, it is, you know, as much as a lot of people like to look past the mindset, and I was already quite uh, a driven person anyway, so I would tend to look past the mindset because I'm like, I can do this anyway. But I think a lot of the time people do look past the mindset and they're looking for the value, but you really do need that self-belief and, and, and mm. the mindset there for you to believe it. You know, yes, and the second you speak to sellers, you know, you, you, you know how, you know where you're at. 
Sorry for interrupting your video, but I wanted to introduce you to a great lawyer in the UK who can get your deals done for you. He's worked for 50 of my mastermind clients in the last few months alone. His name is John Andrews, and I've got his details right here in my little black book of contacts. You can phone him on 0345 241 2494, or you can email him on johnandrews.deallawyer at jmw.co.uk. UK. If you want someone who can get a deal done, he is your guy. So let's get back to the video. You will have the odd hard call. Yeah, but what, 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 most, what most new buyers worry about is being in a, in a situation where they can't, um, uh, they, they, they are shown up to be a newbie. Yeah. And they don't, they don't want to be in that very vulnerable position. But what everyone forgets is that the seller is a newbie and has never yeah, sold, it, yeah. sold a business before. So as long as you know more about the process than they do, you're gonna be okay. Yeah, so one of the things I think you should always be the buyer, and it sounds very straightforward and common sense, but you need to be able to control the conversation. And like you said, most sellers are looking for you to coach them through the process because they've never done it either. So um, an analogy I like to use is when you go to buy a car, you, a buyer can turn into a seller quite quickly. So you go to buy a car and the first thing people would normally do is tell, try and sell them all the reasons why they should sell the car cheaper to you. So then you're pushing the power into the, the seller's um, the seller's position because you're like, it needs new tires, it's got a dent there, so you should sell me the car for cheaper. So you're pushing the control out of your hands mm -hmm. where if you approach it differently and you're like, look, but it's the car I'm looking for. I think it's fairly priced. It's got a few niggles around the car. It does need some new tires, but it is what I'm looking for. I've got a few others to see today. I'll keep saving your number and call you later. And straight away, the seller is going to turn into the seller and they're going to try and sell you the reason to keep you there. It's the same thing when you're talking to a business owner. If you try and sell them all the reasons, of course you want to point out the imperfections of the company in a subtle way so they understand that we're aware of them. Mm -hmm. But I usually roll past them and I'll come back to them because you need to maintain that buyer position where they know that you're in control without being arrogant, you know? And I think that's helped me a lot um, speaking to sellers and really trying to help them find the solution while remaining humble at the same time. Yeah, I think that's such a, such a good attitude. Mm. And you can, you can feel in the conversation where it turns, where they are selling you on you buying it from them oh yeah and uh and it's and it's always when you just you pull back slightly or like you said i'm gonna go look at some some other cars first yeah. you just pull back slightly and that's when they start giving you all the reasons why it's such yeah. a great deal for you and how they can make the deal better for you oh you want them to sell you it and, and that that's what you're waiting for the second yeah. they do that like i think not being too eager as well just you know making them aware that there's other people out there that I'm speaking to. And exactly. I don't, I think it's important not to get emotionally attached to a deal. There's, mm. there is always another one. And no matter how much work you spend on one, um, you know, I know it sounds cliche when they say some of the best deals are the ones you walk away from, but it's true. You know, I've done bad deals because I, I I'm a, I'm, I would class myself as a driver. So I'm just like, if it's 80% of the way there, I'm getting it done. And that's what was important now where the people that I've brought involved they're, one of them is super conservative. So he's more of like, let's pull back a little bit. He's more analytical. So it's, it's, that's, that works well. But yeah, never be scared to walk away from a deal. I've, I wish I walked away from a deal. <laughs> Why do you think then that sometimes people don't? They, they, they stick with something even though they know deep down it's not the right deal to do. I think it's getting emotionally attached. I think mm. one of the things I think is really important in – like, you know, this is just an investment at the end of the day, right? There's always time risk and capital risk in investment. And I think that the behaviors, behavioral finance and just uh, analyzing yourself and being aware of what you're willing to do, your risk appetite and time horizon in most of the things that you invest in, it's very hard to understand both of those things until something goes wrong because you don't understand how big your risk appetite is or what your real time horizon is in, apart from what your plan is, right? So, um, when you start understanding the behaviors of finance, I think that's when the psychological aspect of investing helps. And 
we get emotionally attached because of the fear of missing out. I think that, yeah, you know, oh, I've done a lot of work on this deal. I'm sure I can make it work, even if it's a bad deal, yes. just to try and get it over the line. And they end up just, that's the where the time risk comes in and capital. So, risk, so, yeah. so I see people, um, so we have a, a LinkedIn group for all the people on the mastermind program. Mm. So the, the the main subject of conversation is I'm looking at this business. How do I finance this? It's that, it's that sort of conversation. Uh, and I see quite often people say, there's this deal, these are the details, these are, these are all the things that are wrong with it, but how do I still make it work? And what I always think is that the only reason you're spending all this time and effort on a deal that you, you've told us is not a good deal mm. is because you don't have any alternatives. Mm. So if you've got deal flow, if you've got yeah. options, if you're looking at three or four other businesses, you wouldn't spend any time on that one. You just move yeah. on. 100%. Deal flow is the most important, right? If there's no volume, yeah. then you've got a lack of choice, which usually means you will try and force a deal to happen. Um, and I, I, I notice a lot of people in the business buying space, they're scared to invest in deal flow. You know, mm. it's, it's going to cost money, right? Whether you're sending letters out and, you, and you're paying for stamps or whether you're doing other alternative strategies, it's going to cost money. But the reward on the other side of it, and it is hard, like you said, it's that belief aspect of, of wondering what if this doesn't happen. But if you approach this, you give it time, it's the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And I've invested in tons of asset classes. Um, I tried many things. This is by far the most rewarding. You're buying income. And in life, the, the, the two things you invest in, the, the two outcomes, one, some sort of capital appreciation, or you're going to get income. Mm -hmm. And income's a thing that gets you through month to month and allows you to have a certain lifestyle and all the things that come with it. Um, you know, it was all good having that capital growth across assets, et cetera, but you're waiting for it and you're either going to refinance it or sell it. To me, income's the most important thing. And that's the reward you get when you buy a business is you get access to, to, to income that's pretty good <laughs> if you yeah. buy the right business absolutely yeah. so so i i used to use the example of um you're looking for something that can make you ten thousand pounds a month mm. and uh, for, for many people that's actually a, a very large a very large number mm. so they can't quite get their head around how this ten thousand pounds a month can happen and i said do you think it's feasible for a business to make a hundred and twenty thousand pounds mm. profit a year and they go well yeah a business can make a hundred and twenty thousand pounds profit a year well that's ten thousand pounds a month for you yeah, I know there's tax and everything. I know that, yeah. but 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 the concept is yeah. ten thousand pounds a month might be a lot for an individual, but one hundred and twenty thousand pounds a year is not a lot for a business. Mm. But once you own the business, that's yours. Yeah, and so especially you can buy a relatively small business that will pay you more than a CEO of a FTSE one hundred company, and this. this that's that's powerful. actually a really good way of putting yeah. it. Yeah, that's powerful, yeah. right? Because you know people would spend a lot of time and a lot of hard work, a lot of hours to get to that sort of level. Um, and of course it's not easy, but you know, if you focus on businesses with good management structure, it's still not going to be easy, but good management structure, um, something already has systems and processes that are fairly automated or systemized. Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to be more hands off for you. You're not going to be putting a CEO hours in, put it that way, and you're going to be getting paid more than a CEO. Yeah, so. and, and also <laughs> that person has spent decades oh, yeah. reaching that position and can be fired at any moment. And I think the, the, another good thing to add to that is the business that you're buying, it's taken them decades to get to where it is. Yeah. And you're, you know, um, I've recently, um, one of someone I've partnered with on a deal that, you know, they just bought a company that's been going for 33 years. And he's, he's, he's mid twenties. So when you start looking at, he, he was, he wasn't even born when that business started to put the work in. And th yeah. I think this is where, um, the power comes in. And I think that's why, you know, especially now going uh, to the, for the future ahead, of course, there's going to be opportunities to start businesses. And I do feel that people are having no choice, but to become slightly more entrepreneurial, to follow sort of mm -hmm. the U S but would you rather buy something that's been here for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, already has everything in it, already gone through the pain? Or would you rather start something, no brand, no customers, no money in the bank? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, for me, it's a no-brainer. And, and, and these days, it's, you know, recruitment 
uh, is has always been difficult, but it continu it continues to to be increasingly difficult. So if you've got a fully staffed business, well, that's a big tick there. If you've got a website that's ranked well, that's getting leads every day, I mean, yeah, people spend years and don't achieve that. So you've got that from from the word go. You've got that positive cash flow. You've got a reputation. You know, you're yeah. you're, you're buying the thirty years, thirty plus years of reputation. Um, and you can do a deal for a business like that in a matter of months. It's not you don't have to spend years putting the deal together. You can do it in months and occasionally weeks. But, yeah, for, for a business like that, maybe within four months, you can buy that. Oh, yeah. Uh, one of the ones we, we completed on an e-commerce business about two and a half weeks ago. Um, There's actually two fairly young business owners, um, which was a bit different for what we normally uh, mm -hmm. for we normally speak to. Um, they just had enough. They're like, look, I, you know, we just don't want to do it anymore. We got other things that we want to do, um, but you know, they, that company, it already had everything in it. They, they got Google's their customer, HSBC's their customer. You know, huge blue chip customers. Yes. For us to start that same brand, and try and even attempt to get those customers with like Premiership football clubs, it's insane. And I, and we had it for less than one X. And, oh wow! And e-commerce, those multiples are usually yeah. they want demand serious. So just explain that for our listeners, just just so people understand the the yeah. importance of what you've just yeah. said there. So we paid basically one year's net profit for it. You know, so oh, of course one you year's can net profit. Yeah, so of course you can usually adjust it, add backs, and all the other stuff. But we just looked at their bare net profit. Um, we offered them it was just under actually um, one year's net profit for the business, and. It already had everything. It was it's e commerce. There's there's very little overheads, but they've got thousands of clients and mm. they're just super motivated to get they they've been offered other opportunities, right? And I don't think they was in the in a pretty good financial position anyway. Um so they had enough and we'll luckily through our deal flow, this come in front of us and yeah, it it didn't take long to complete because it was pretty straightforward. They you know, it's and just if, if I thought of this doing that even a few years ago, it's you know, I'm just trying to get those sort of clients is so hard. How do you get in front of, of those people, right? Of so, course. but then what it does is when those clients you get, whether it is those clients or whether it's a different sector, the clients you get that's the credibility. So, when you approach other people, you've already got the credibility because they've already been servicing clients for years and years and years. So, yeah, yeah, but like you said, deal flow. If you're not in the game and you're not you're not active, well, you said about some people push back on the time and effort uh, uh, and maybe cost of of generating that deal flow. But when I say to them, "What's your what's your three to five year goal?" and they say, "Oh, it's five million pounds," mm. I say, "Okay, so how much is that thousand letters going to cost you?" So oh, about a thousand pounds, right? Okay, so, so let me just get this right. You don't want to spend a thousand pounds, but you definitely want the five million, don't you? Oh, I definitely want the five million, right? Well, come on, put the effort, put the effort in. You know. It's the risk reward. Or spend the money. Yeah, but if you weigh up the risk reward, risk reward with deal flow, you know, if you did spend fifty grand over a few years, which is you know, if you're that unfortunate to have to spend that much money before you got a deal, but if you, even if you did, if it cost you fifty grand to get a business that's even just doing a hundred k a year in, in net, you know, forever, <laughs> and you got yes. your op opportunity to grow it as uh, well. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, typically you you'd need to look at let's say. Eight, ten, twelve businesses to find to find one. Mm. So most people who want to buy one business business have, have only ever got to generate eight, ten, twelve leads, which yeah. is, which is not that many, <laughs> no, is it? No. If you think about other businesses, other types of business where you have to generate hundreds of leads to get a, a, a client, yeah. sometimes yeah, depending on the value of the of what you're selling. So so um, yeah, it it it's worth it. Because the reward at the end is so big. Oh, insane. Um, I, I think that it's the, it's the quickest, like, you know, there's no for fast track to financial freedom, as, as people say, but I think this is the quickest way. I think if, if, if you look at anything, you know, I, I was in the property space for years. Mm -hmm. um, there's no quick way in property. You know, that's, yeah. a, that's, a, that's a long game. Um, you, you might hit it lucky with the economy where, I mean, there was a period... There, there have been a couple of periods, haven't mm. there, where everything seems to sort of double in value over sort yeah. of three, four years. Um, but that doesn't happen very frequently. And if we could all time it 
and knew when it was going to happen, we'd all buy property just before it doubled yeah. in, in value. Yeah, and if and if you're buying and you're holding them as for rental income, you know they're just unrealized gains anyway. Mm-hmm. Then until you realize that you sell it, it's you know the equity's there. But so there's no fast track in property. There's no fast track in anything really. But mm-hmm. you know the reason why I think this is the quickest because it's the quickest way to scale. Is the reason why Amazon go and buy other businesses in different they sectors. They don't. They yeah. they've got all the infrastructure and capital to start them. But they don't. They buy them. Yes. <laughs> so there's yes. a reason. Um, so yeah, but it is the quickest way because you buy an income essentially, and um, I think that's the most important thing to focus on. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, we, we've we've covered lots of uh, different areas of of business buying here. What do you think the mistakes are that the new business buyer makes? Um, I think they don't put the time in. Initially, I think mm-hmm. this does take time, um, and probably the self belief. I think that the, the quickest thing you can do, the best thing you can do, is take action. Just get a seller on the phone, go through the experience of speaking to them, because this is a lonely game, right? And I think it's important to have groups and be a part of groups because one for accountability, but two is good mm-hmm. to hear what other people are doing because it is that you know kick up the bum, you know. So I think that that's important. But the biggest mistakes for me, I think, are, are, are underestimating that you will need to put time in. But the reward for that time is exponential. So, but there's there's tons of little mistakes people are going to make. Of course, mm. you know, when it comes to terms, um, I've seen people agree because the price isn't legally binding. I see people put silly prices in there and then think they can negotiate later down the line, which of course you can. Oh, so so at the heads of terms stage, they put in a high price. To get them accepted. To get yeah. the to get the, past the first stage of the deal and then believe they can knock it down dramatically just yeah. before getting it. I think, okay. look, of course you could go back to renegotiate once you start. Private like, equity uh, <laughs> have a habit of doing that. Oh, yeah. You know, and, yeah. I think that... You want to be as close to the money as possible. Of course, you can leave some wiggle room because all, mm. things are always going to come up in due diligence, um, and you can push back. But if you if if you're if you've got them to agree a price that's nowhere near where you're willing to pay, mm-hmm. or it's just not yeah, affordable, it's not, it's, not, it's not right. I think you're wasting time. But I, I I think people do a lot of those things just to get answers and mm-hmm. take a little bit more time. Because you're going to be putting yourself in a much better position when it comes to the actual negotiation, which is one of the hardest parts. Because you can get someone to agree on the fact that they're going to sell their business to you because mm-hmm. you built good rapport, which mm-hmm. is very important. But to get them to negotiate and pay what well, you want them to pay and agree to the way you want those terms to look, that's hard. Um, yeah. So I think that, you know, there needs to be a bit of give and take. And, and I do think that if you, if, if the seller feels that they've been taken advantage of, you know, mm. the, the price that you said you'd pay dropped dramatically the day before completion. And there are buyers who do that, uh, just like there are sellers who want to put the price up yeah. the day before completion. And private equity does have a, a reputation in, in some areas for for. Uh, chipping at the price but i think that's when the seller gets their own back at some point by sabotaging the business and key relationships and um uh deliberately losing the password to uh, whatever you know <laughs> yeah uh, so so it's not it's not for a happy relationship ongoing mm. if you if you try those sharp tactics is it no um yeah i think if you build good rapport, you found good common ground with, with the seller and you're there or thereabouts on the negotiation, you're better to be a little bit more upfront earlier on when you're agreeing terms than trying to go back and doing, redoing the whole structure yes, again. I, yes. that, that's when problems arise and the chance of the deal falling out of bed then. And sometimes though you can keep the, keep the agreed price which is really what people focus on, and change the terms yeah. according to the risk that you've discovered during diligence. Oh, definitely. And I think that it's also important, I think, to do a lot of pre-due diligence. So I, I had a few deals that went sideways later on when I'm already racking up um, legal fees, right? And it's all, you know, you can try and put them on contingency if you, you get a good lawyer, um, or you can charge them to the deal. Um, but if there's no deal, you can't charge them to the deal. Mm-hmm. So I've had a few that's gone like that. So we've 
put a system in place now where we do a lot of pre-due diligence, send out a document request, everything that we need for financial and legal. So basically, before, you're saying be before you incur any fees, you make sure it's something that's likely to happen? Yeah, so once they've agreed terms, they've signed heads of terms, then we'll send a document request over. We want every single document before we even start. Um, we get those, we have a quick call with um, the accountants and, and, and the lawyer, make sure everything's there. If there's any additional questions, then you know we do like a bit of like a house survey before we start official yes. DD. And then once they give us a thumbs up and say everything's here, of course they can't see everything there and then, but when, well, it's better than not seeing anything. Exactly. Yeah. And then the chance of the deal falling out of bed is obviously a lot less if you already have everything and they've yeah. okayed it. So that's helped us a lot. <laughs> yeah, nice idea. Yeah. Very good. So a lot of people uh, watching and listening to this have been sitting on the fence for a while. Mm. Uh, and do, you know, do they take the first step? Do, you know, what, what, what should they do first? What, what do you say to those people? I would say... Just take action. Um, I know it sounds very straightforward. The, the, the secret formula is take action. You know, you're going to learn as you go along. You're going to, um, just through experience, there's going to be things that it's hard to teach until you do it. Yeah. So you have all the base that lay all the sort of the basics out and, 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 you know, learn as much as you can. And I know you, you have tons of stuff on this. And there, but you need to take action. You can be the smartest person down the pub and you know everything about buying a business, but if you don't actually get on with it, you're never going to do it. I, it's, it's hard to say. Once you've done it, it's the best thing you'll ever, you would have ever have done. And it opens up all sorts of doors in life for you, um, once you once you sort of get on board with it. Just taking that first step. Yeah. Great advice, Dee. Thank you yeah. very much for your time. And uh, I know you've got some some big deals in the in the pipeline, haven't you? Yeah, um, we're working between the UK and the US at the moment. So we spent March and April out in the States. Um, one of my business partners in the States. So uh, we was initially targeting the sector that he had an exit in, but he's gone to all sorts of non competes and stuff. So we've targeting different things out there now. Um, and yeah, we're we're working on quite a large deal out there, but we're also one in the UK, so we're split at the moment. But it's lucky we had a few of us. So, um, but yeah, I wouldn't even imagine doing this size of deals that we're working on now, even eighteen months ago. You know, I was. And what do you put that down to? What the, the what, what do you put put down to? You know, you're, you're thinking bigger, but why? Why would you think bigger? I think it's when you realise it can happen. Yeah. I don't think anything's out of reach. Like we, you know, I know that you've sold and bought from private equity, but it sounds daunting until you speak to them. And then you're like, oh, I can do this. It's, you know, I think it's because you feel that at times maybe I've got a lack of experience, so I can't do those yeah, big deals. Yeah. But you can. It, you can do the big deals. Um, you just have to have the right team around you. And if you have to take a little bit more time, take a bit more time. But I don't think any deal is out of reach for, for anyone, really. Of course, within reason but I think anyone can go and do big deals well, well I think generally people think too small yeah they, they say Jonathan how do I buy this business that turns over 200,000 or 300,000 well, why are you thinking like that yeah well because yeah I currently earn 40,000 in my job if I buy a business that turns over 400,000 that's 10 times what I get yeah. in my job and say so, well it doesn't this, you can't compare the two things mm -hmm. go bigger go go a million plus and uh, get that first deal over the line I also think the bigger deals, they're easier to finance. They're, yes, they are. You know, they've got be better man they've got management structure. Yep. They have... Um, because bigger businesses need management. Yeah, they've got all the management policy. Everything is there um, mm. on the bigger businesses. So I would encourage people to do bigger deals. You know, no more I know now, I, I wouldn't... I probably would have started on bigger deals just because you get more out of them. And usually, it's not much difference in time to do a small one and no, a big exactly. one. <laughs> but you're restricted typically by your comfort zone, aren't yeah. you? And people don't want to move out of their comfort zone. And uh, yeah, there have been people on this on this podcast that have sort of gone gone big from, from day one uh, and surprised themselves. Yeah. Uh, and then looked looked back and thought, oh my goodness, how, how did I have the nerve to do that? And there are other people who, who do start small, but stay small. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important to recognise that, like you say, the bigger deals are easier, easier to finance. They're better businesses of, you know, typically. Yeah. Let's uh, let's do those bigger deals as quickly as possible.
yeah I, I like i said if, if you do want to do some of the smaller deals and you want to you know um consolidate or keep buying bolt some on and then consolidate and make them more resourceful and mm. cut costs of course that's another way to do it and that works very well too um but yeah it depends what you're looking for i think everyone's on a different pathway right i think that yeah. if if you want to build business acumen because you haven't run a business business before and maybe you want to take not a full owner operator role but you want to be more involved to understand mm. business um there may be a smaller one to start with but yeah if, if you already have some experience in business uh, they're just numbers at the end of the day um so it probably best just to go a bit bigger d that is great advice yeah. Thank you very much for coming down. And maybe uh, once you've progressed some of these mm. larger acquisitions in the US, we'll get you back and find out about those and, mm. and what you can you can teach other people about your experiences. Sound good. I appreciate you inviting me down. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Brilliant. Cool. Thank you. Cheers.